And if I told you once, I ain't gonna tell you twice. Salute all my real ones. Yeah. Listen, champ, we got how brands like Domino's profit from school lunch. Bro, I don't know what school lunch they talking about, because at the end of the day, when I used to go to elementary school, I ain't never get no Domino's level worth of pizza. That government pizza with the government cheese and the, and the pepperoni that looks like it was stepped on by 48 people with Tim's on was straight trash, bro. It was trash. We're going to get straight to this video. Like button, subscribe button, notification bell, press those. Let's go. A lot about school lunches in America. And the food itself doesn't always get the best. Yo, look at that. Look at that. Bro, that looks like plaster mixed with like butter and, and melted, melted alien guts. I don't know what the, that it's is, bro. When I think about school lunch, I think of boiled hamburgers. And the cheese was always like plasticky. The staler it was, the more delicious it was. Yeah, I see my face. From Hollywood depictions to real life memories, the school cafeteria is a quintessential part of American culture. But who decides what food gets put on the tray? And how come one school serves this on a $1.25 budget while another serves this? Why are teachers working at McDonald's for a night? And how does a slice of Domino's pizza meet USDA guidelines? Those are all loaded questions with complicated answers. But if you really boil it down, the answer is money. Lots and lots of money. Today, the 4.9 billion lunches that get doled out in school cafeterias every year make up a multi-billion dollar industry that makes sure millions of kids are fed. It starts with federal money, but on its way to cafeterias, school districts have to order the meals, and food giants grab a big slice of the school lunch pie. But before we get to all of this... The food fight sweeping school cafeterias... Going from tray... <coughs> ...to trash. Let's go back to the 1800s. The 1800s? In 1853, the Children's Aid Society of New York started an informal lunch program for its vocational school. But it wasn't until the 1930s that school lunches really caught on in the rest of the country. In about the 1890s, you see a real expansion in the role of schools in communities. I mean, they actually start to become social institutions. And so uh, in addition to basic education, they're also providing uh, health services. And one of the things that happens when you know physicians and nurses start working in, in schools, they start documenting all kinds of cases of things like malnourishment. In 1935, right. Congress set aside money for school lunch programs. Not everyone in the community supported the government's efforts to feed kids during the day. Restaurant owners sued school districts for lost business. The courts typically cited in favor of the school's right to operate lunchrooms. Right. And by 1941, roughly 6 million kids were eating food provided by the government. That food came from products farmers had too much of, like pork, dairy, and Damn, meat. Damn, so you're saying that that was like the excess leftovers unwanted food. In the 40s, the makes federal sense. government passes the National School Lunch Act, and this makes it possible to actually fund the you program. Saying, this chisel with. body right here was built off the excess by millions of American children. It all makes sense now, man. By this time, man. other countries around the world had already developed their own school lunch systems. While the U.S. took the lead from European countries, there was one thing that made school lunches in the U.S. distinctly American. A hint of capitalism. The fundamental basis for school lunches was a, a sort of business model. They often adopted uh, like little tokens, like little coins, or used like tickets of some sort that, you know, paying kids would buy. And right. then kids who were receiving uh, free lunches would be given the, the ticket. But the idea is that you were exchanging something. There was a transaction. Enter the school lunch lobby. Today, you have groups like the School Nutrition Association and National School Boards Association advocating on behalf of the schools. And corporations like Tyson and PepsiCo show face at meetings to make sure their products are on school districts' minds. Meanwhile, groups like the Food Research Action Center and the Center on Budget and Priorities keep a close watch on nutrition. Robert Doerr worked as a commissioner under Mayor Bloomberg, where he administered food assistance programs in New York City. And he's no stranger to the lobbying efforts in the world of government assistance. It is true that the interests here are not only 
what's best for low-income families. The other interests are the various providers of food. This is true in anything we do in government. Anytime the federal government is spending significant dollars on right. product, like something simple like feeding kids leads into greed. Maximizing that spending. In 1966, Congress passed the Child Nutrition Act, expanding the school lunch program. In 1969, about 15% of kids were getting their lunch for free or at a lower price. In fiscal year 2017, that number had risen to 73%. That meant that millions of trays needed to be filled every day, and that created a business opportunity. School lunch programs really start to move away from scratch cooking and toward this kind of factory prepared meal that's been reheated and then served to them. And then came the funding fights, which led to the infamous ketchup controversy. In 1981, the Reagan administration wanted to cut $1 billion in school lunch funding. In order to meet the nutritional guidelines while staying on a budget, the Department of Agriculture got creative and declared ketchup a vegetable. The backlash was so strong, the funding cut was quickly reversed. But ketchup hasn't been the only product to stretch the definition of what makes a vegetable. Even today, some school pizza sauces count as a serving of veggies. French fries, obviously, are made out of potatoes, and potatoes are a vegetable. That uh, was another defeat, I would say, that the USDA experienced because of industry lobbying. Yes, fries still count as a veggie. Frozen potato wedges are on the USDA's vegetable list for child nutrition programs. Those bags of frozen foods have to come from somewhere, which is where companies like Tyson come in. The company, valued at more than $21 billion, saw the opportunity and acted. Tyson has its own K-12 product catalog of frozen foods made just for school cafeterias. Yeah, we reached out to Tyson like for comment and to see how much of their business comes from cars, its K-12 car, food products. Cars, the cars company didn't respond, and its K-12 and earnings aren't specified in its annual like preservatives and but all that frozen shit. foods aren't the only way to cash in on school lunches. In 2014, the USDA came up with something called Smart Snack Guidelines, making the snack line healthier. Which meant if big food companies wanted to keep their products in schools, they had to adapt. Now, nearly every major food manufacturer in the U.S. has a catalog of products custom made to meet USDA standards. We felt like kids were getting exposed to these brands, you know, like Frito-Lay brands, and then they would go to the grocery store and want to buy that brand, and it's not the same product. We did a study where we really put the two products side by side. Just looking at that, it's super obvious that the companies really made no effort <laughs> to distinguish the one they were selling in school versus right. the one you could buy in the store. Of course. The product on the left, labeled Special Edition, is sold in schools. It has 7 grams of sugar. Vitamin C, 25%. The product on the right, sold in stores, has 10, 10 grams, grams of sugar. sugar. The vitamin C in this one is just 10%. Oh, so it is different. And those custom-made foods aren't just in the snack line. Domino's has a special Smart Slice program with pizzas tailor-made to meet USDA standards. And the more pizzas schools buy, the more rewards points they rack up. Those can be traded in for Domino's swag and even cafeteria equipment. Domino's told us, quote, We are proud of our school lunch product. It meets the USDA guidelines for school nutrition standards and is something that kids love to eat. It is also good for the schools as it is simple for them to serve and keeps lunch participation rates high. It also said that schools make the choice as to whether to serve their pizza branded or unbranded. Remember the SNA, one of the lobbies on behalf of schools? They're listed as a Smart Slice partner. And it's worth mentioning, Domino's, Tyson, and a number of other major food companies are SNA industry members meaning they pay money for monthly newsletters, advertising discounts, and access to local legislative contacts. The SNA said, quote, While many schools are working to increase the amount of freshly prepared and scratch-made menu items, those with limited equipment and labor resources rely on healthy, pre-prepared foods to ensure students receive balanced meals each day. Corporate money reaches far beyond the lunchroom. It works its way into school sporting events and celebrations through fundraisers. Think of scoreboards, parking lot signs, pizza parties, or that summer reading program. Krispy Kreme sponsors a major fundraising program too. And McDonald's has a McTeacher's Night fundraising program uh, where teachers come in to work the counter in hopes that their kids come in to see them. 
It caught a lot of flack from school districts, with LAs ending the program altogether. But some schools still participate. None of those companies returned our request for comment. Where's Subway's at? Where's Chipotle so why do at? Care Where's so the much? healthy places schools at? Schools need food, and big companies have it. But the childhood obesity rate has more than tripled since the 1970s. And with roughly 30 million kids getting their lunch from a government-funded program, it raises the question, what responsibility does the government have to make their meals healthy? In 2010, Michelle Obama spearheaded a major change to the system with the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. We have an obligation to make sure that those meals are as nutritious as possible. It tightened nutrition guidelines for cafeterias across the country, requiring them to serve more fruits and vegetables. At first, its noble intentions were praised, but some took issue with how it actually played out in lunchrooms across the country. Kids throw food away at about the right. same rate as the rest of America. Right. But after the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, people just started noticing it more. More kids were taking fruit. It went up significantly, but the same proportion was getting eaten and thrown away. So more is getting eaten and more is getting thrown away. Schools seem to be caught in this cycle of a lack of funding, kitchen training, and time. While there are federal regulations, the menus really come from the schools on a local level. They're the ones ordering and preparing the food, and since it's decentralized, Bro. it's hard to know which companies are making the most money, and if kids are really getting fed quality meals. But some people are trying to change that on a local level. Dan Giusti is the former head chef of Noma. Where if he it was up to me, kids would eat dinosaur barbecue every day. Now he's yeah, I don't know what dinosaur is. It's working just to bring wings, cooking, ribs, just and mac and cheese. Stations to kitchens on a dollar twenty-five budget, and he's trying to change the reputation of school lunches altogether. It's almost like it's this rite of passage, like as a as a student in, a, in an institution, like. That's just what you get. You get lousy food. Right. In May 2018, the Trump administration rolled back some of the rules around whole grains, sodium, and flavored milks to give schools more flexibility in their meal planning. The politics, money, and controversy around school lunches aren't going away. But at the end of the day, the kids are the ones it really impacts. And for some, school lunches are the best meal they're going to get throughout the day. These kids are showing up to school every day, but at home they're not eating, and it makes you rethink everything, like holidays, like, oh, three-day weekend, great. Well, that means that these kids aren't eating for three days, or snow days, but that means that not only are these kids not eating, but they're also at home in an environment that's probably not good for them. Studies have shown that if kids are fed, they perform better in school. And with millions of kids relying on free or low-cost lunches every day, it's a big, important problem to solve. Yeah, man, <clears throat> that that that's crazy. Like, yo, know, it, it's it's amazing to me how politics plays into everything. Even even whether or not you want to feed kids the future of this country, healthy foods or not, they're still playing politics with it. Yeah, French fries are a vegetable. Yo, if I tried to sell, tell that to my mother or or to anybody I know, like, yo, you know, French fries are healthy because they're vegetables. They'd be like. The fuck you talking about? But you know, that's just me. Uh, yeah, man. You know, I I really like uh watching these types of videos and reacting to them, just because like you get to learn something. You know what I'm saying? You get to see what the bots in the matrix are dealing with, and you and, and us that that already got ourselves out the matrix. We get to watch these people and be like, you know what? These are the decisions that we made to make sure that we are actually informed and living off the earth and living healthy. You know what I'm saying? But I'm gonna leave it right there. Make sure you press that like button. My name is Rain. Catch you on the flip side. RCP to the way for it.